Welcome to the Mail Zone Podcast. This is episode 49, recorded on August 2nd, 2021. I'm Tom. And I'm Stefan. And on today's podcast episode, we uh, again start with a bit of the a bit of a rant on uh, yeah 3D printer companies company malpractices uh, and talk about Angus's recent videos about um, yeah paid reviews of 3D printers why we already have like the 30th or 50th like carbon copy of an Ender 3, uh, what we can do about it and why there is currently that lack of innovation. Um, the next topic covers um, something that sounds really interesting in the beginning, 3D printing using orange peel, um, a artistic Kickstarter lamp that is supposed to be printed out of that material. And we just, yeah talk about if they are really only using orange peels to 3d print or if there is a bit of a marketing shenanigan going on and then also uh yeah some talk about a paper that i stumbled over where like a real polymer is made out of the limonene that is in the peel of oranges and we also talk about uh, other use cases for the 3d printers that we have as in using them as a three-axis robot because that is a super versatile um, approach to using the machines as in as in uh, the first one is a soldering robot that actually solders up PCBs and uh, does through hole components and the second one is a plotter just a brief touch on that uh, then we move on to a new feature in Fusion 360 which is every reverse engineer's dream um, where it turns an STL into an actual parametric feature-based model. Super useful, um, but unfortunately only in the paid version. And finally, we do answer a question from Bioluminous Commercial Art Service. I, I, I love that name. Uh, why is there no one-size-fits-all 3D printer material? So your print finished? The print did finish. It is nice and quiet now, yeah. So that was, <laughs> that was a print on the... Uh, I, I can never remember the name. It's not Forum, but it's Flash Forge. The Flash Forge Voxy Lab uh, or Voxel AB uh, mm -hmm. Aquila, a printer that was hyped. I, actually, let me let me show you real quick right behind there. Um, the I mean, Aquila hype printer. Like whenever I do a, a something in the three, like everyone's like, "Oh, you gotta try the Aquila." And I unbox it, it's an Ender 3, as it turns out. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I, I thought I was going to be able to do a print um, just in the time, you know, until we, we start recording this podcast. Uh, the slicer, their slicer, Voxel Maker, said four hours, four minutes. Oh, I already turned it off, but um, it turns out the print was like five hours, 45 minutes. So <laughs> it's, uh, even though simple things still aren't solved, like it's, it's, still, it's still an Ender 3. And, if anyone saw the live stream of me unboxing it, I'm I'm like really having a hard time getting excited about another Ender 3. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can imagine that. So the Ender 3 and, and like all its variants ha have been already around for a while. Um, it's been like five years. Are they it? still using... Uh, are they also just using like a skinned version of Cura or... No, so the, the, they... the Voxel Maker they're including is a completely scratch built program and you okay. can see it's like it's what you would expect from a you know from scratch slicer uh the preview is horrible the estimates are horrible some settings are missing um it does slice and the results are okay but you can see it's just very rough still mm -hmm. and uh, it's like wh why didn't they just skin cure like if i i would i would very much prefer manufacturers to use something that is already there that has years of development and and tens of thousands of man hours um mm. put into it for development why are they trying to reinvent the wheel when they're not managing to like the, the, the so on the one hand they, they try to do a new slicer I guess just to avoid the Ultimaker or, or Prusa branding on Cura or Prusa Slicer. Mm. But on the other hand, they they don't use the the improvements and the solutions that we've had for like super common stuff on their printer. Um, mm. 
So that is, the, yeah, that's that, that's that's my my grief with uh, Endo Three and Endo Three clones because you, you you can take the original Endo Three and it's basically the same machine as this thing, as mm. a, this thing that is just slightly off frame for you guys watching. Just uh, like the video. looking a bit different. So what what you want to say? They should have used like the time and money they put into the slicer in improving on like the hardware design of the machine it's so it's i think we've talked about this before but it's not necessarily you need to throw more money at the problem you just need to do them more intelligently and that's that's what i what i think prusa is doing really well they're not using like super duper high-end component yeah that the mark 3s plus now is getting a bit old and you know it's getting really long in the, t in the teeth is that how you say that but you can see like everything they do is actually is finished is polished is like they're doing a good job with the stuff they do even if they're using limited hardware like mm -hmm. uh, basic lma to use or um you know the 8 bit board in there i think the the 8 bit experience on on that printer is better than the 32 bit experience on on many of the other printers <laughs> so <laughs> even though yeah 8 bit is is like not not appropriate on a new machine these days uh especially because 32 bit is cheaper but mm. Yeah, what, what, what I'm saying is they should just, like, either not make a printer like that, <laughs> like, the the Aquila or most of the other Endo 3 clones, they have no reason to exist except for market oversaturation and for trying to take up time and space, for wasting mm -hmm. people's time and space, basically. Um, yeah. And that is... Um, that's basically what Angus talked about with his uh, seven 3D printer manufacturer's sins. Um, they're, they're, they're just putting so many mach machines on the market to drown out everyone else, to waste reviewers' time um, so they mm -hmm. can't review any other machines anymore. And to like Amazon storefront, you look at uh, you look at what printers there are, it's just, it's in the threes. And that's kind of sad. It's kind of sad. I'm, I'm always asking myself why companies still think that it's worth putting like a 50th Ender 3 clone on the market um, if they don't really distinguish themselves because there are already good alternatives. And I guess in the end, the only thing that they are competing at is is price. Um, of it's course, not one- not even price, man. They're, they're all 180 bucks. They all cost the same. Yeah. But this is the thing I'm asking myself, why would somebody buy one of those machines instead of like a well and proven Creality Endo 3, even though also not everything works in that machine or yeah, works in that machine. If there is barely anything in, yeah, where, where they distinguish themselves. You, you, you're thinking way too reasonably about this. You, you, you're thinking yeah, probably, yeah. <laughs> The thing is, like, purchasing decisions in particular are not always reasonable decisions. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of the things that play into it is just, oh, hype, marketing, um, mm -hmm. paid reviews or influenced reviews. Mm -hmm. um, like, the, the, the product being presented as being better than all the other alternatives, um, even though yeah. it is not. I think that's that, that there's always... A new printer there's always one that that, that mm. claims to be doing these couple of things better but most of the time what i'm seeing with with the end of three clones it's yeah it's the aquila biggest feature it has a 4.3 inch color screen it's doing that really well the screen is fantastic but everything else about the printer is is like zero progress at all um so <laughs> that they have something that that they can market um but otherwise there's there's nothing moving forward and for the companies it's no I, I don't think there's mm. really any effort involved in, in making another Ender 3. Uh, Ender 3, open source design, sure. They don't even need to do any any uh, development really on the machine itself. Um, they provide some skinned interface, some skinned slicer, and there you go. That's the easiest way to produce or, or develop, mm. if, if you want to call it that, um, a 3D printer and be present yeah. in that market. Yeah, I'm. I think I'm probably a bit a bit biased in that way that I know that well, or well, I know that many of these printers exist and they 
are basically the same thing in the end. So I'm maybe not that influenced by like what you just said, uh, paid reviews or um, I don't know, good marketing. So um, I might maybe be not not somebody who would buy one of these machines and would maybe just go for an endo three uh but if if you're new to the hobby and if you're looking for a machine of course you are more Gullible. more into uh yeah more into buying the machines that are currently reviewed or even if they're just battery those those machines that get a lot of of attention currently yeah. in in social media a lot instead of, of time. Yeah, and ins instead of other ones that are maybe a bit older but do almost uh a similar good job in that regard. But yeah. yeah. The what 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 pains me is just it's there's there's no moving forward. Like price mm -hmm. is the same. Um the the results you get are the same. It's the same hardware. Um mm -hmm. this printer uses the same uh, mediocre at best uh, a hardened design from these from the Creality printers where the Bowden tube goes all the way down to the nozzle mm. which is yeah questionable um, it's and, and a lot of other things that wouldn't even require like developing anything new it's just paying attention um, knowing what the parts do how they should work together and making a correct choice they're just making wrong choices in how they i don't want to say design because that would be giving too much credit but uh, in the way that they manufacture these printers and and mm. how they put together so wh wh what's what's the way out of that is i guess it's up to us as as influencers as much as everyone hates that word but mm. uh, we, we we're the ones that to influence um not just the people buying these prints, but also the manufacturers, possibly. Mm. Yeah, but. I guess in the end, it it comes down to having a new machine that maybe makes something different and gets more and more hyped. That other companies pick up on that trend once again, because like a couple of years before, like many of those prints, you you would get all had that acrylic sheet design yeah. then the cr10 came along then everyone wanted to copy the cr10 then the ender 3 came along everyone started copying that and i don't know what the next one's gonna be is it like the new i don't know at least in in my bubble the hyped voron core xy design look at the ender 7 um or i don't know where it, where it's going to get um or where we are going to be in um yeah. i don't know a couple of months or a couple of years yeah the, the I, I guess the, the end of threes are, are good because they're simple to manufacture there's not a lot of parts mm. to them there's not a lot of like precision needed to make one mm. um on a core xy design you do have some some greater challenges that you know stuff needs to line up um for yeah. it to work properly um yeah, the the Ender Seven. Yeah, that sort of design. They're more complex, and you know, the, a, a big design goal is uh, being cheap, right? Being being yeah. cheaper, maybe not in customer price, but also in in how much it costs to manufacture them. And something like yeah. like a Voron, um, yeah, it's going to be more expensive to build. So there, there's initially going to be um, a a hesitancy from the manufacturers to. Uh, spend the money on building those but also from the customers like how can you justify um, that this printer now costs 50% mm. more or, or twice as much where mm. you get perfectly fine prints like I can grab the if I don't fall over I can grab at least the 3D printer those are in reachable range um, so this one's with a ton of backlash so I mean the prints on the on the Aquila they look fine um, they're a bit of out of focus mm -hmm. unfortunately but they're fine. The, they they all print fine when it comes to like the time that take that it takes you to leave an Amazon review or the time that you spend as a review with a machine, uh, because you can't you can't really push like ten spools of filament through a printer to to fully evaluate it. Um, but the thing about these printers, a lot of the design choices that the the, the flaw design choices that they make um, are going to reflect in this thing not working so well anymore after two 
three, four, five, or ten spools of filament. And that's like that's past the hype at that point. Like nobody cares about the print anymore. You you may you mm. you will have put out the next one already. So yeah, yeah. This, I guess I guess all we, all we can do is just keep calling it out when they make poor design choices. Why are those two reds different? <laughs> Yeah, yeah well, like we definitely it. should. And this is also something that Angus, I guessed it pretty well. And at least on my side and probably on your side as well, uh, I have been noticing more and more and more uh, emails asking for how much do you charge for a re review even. Uh, so in the past, usually the 3D printer manufacturers approached me approached us and um now it's starting more and more that um marketing agencies yeah. um get into the game and they usually have a <sighs> they have a budget well, that they can spend um they have a budget that yeah. they can spend and um the company that is working together with a mar marketing a agency they have an expectation what they're paying for. So the marketing agency needs to make sure that the outcome of those review showcases or whatever you want to call it is, is positive and um, gives them and the conversions, meaning they want to get people by the machine. Yeah. So they, it's, um, it's something that we need to point out, like, you know, doing showcases, doing sponsored mm -hmm. stuff. It's just something that um, is kind of necessary for online video uh, people to survive. Like I do, I do sponsorships on on my channels of stuff that I believe is worth spending money on. I do make that distinction. Um, uh, I mean, Linus Linus Media Group um, on their channels, they also have product showcases regularly that are um, declared as being sponsored and showcases, and not mm. a as objective as a as a review can be. Um, mm. Not a uh, what's the word they're not judging the product they're just showing it to you um the way that the manufacturer uh asked them to and that they're getting, getting paid for and that's that's fine as long as that is being declared or, or disclosed mm -hmm. not declared uh, as long as that is being disclosed fully honestly and like unambiguously i guess that's the word yeah where, where the viewer knows okay this what i'm watching right mm -hmm. now this is being paid for and 100 percent uh influenced mm. by the manufacturer mm. so th th it, it gets really muddy when that disclosure is not there anymore when it's like mm. oh this this review was paid for um and i guess in some circles it's like it's accepted that the manufacturer would pay for a review um and that's just being taken for granted but to me if a, if mm. a review if there is anything more than providing the means to produce that review if there's mm -hmm. anything more being being given there, um, that should be dis disclosed. And I try my best mm -hmm. uh, to disclose even, you know, the, the machines when typically they're provided by the manufacturer. I, I, I try to make that clear just so, you know, I'm I'm not misleading people, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah. I, I guess in the end, um, this is this might also be one of the reasons why at least we don't do like only reviews on our channels because if we the only basically the only means of of earning money with such a review would be then the affiliate sales and those yep. affiliate sales um for that your video might already be a bit biased but in the end at least i think i haven't made any like review video yet that made me more money than i have put time in in doing it there might be some um of course uh, uh if the product product is good uh that that might be positive for the channel but but if you would only do reviews and not like paid reviews or we will give you money for the time that you spend but uh yeah can you please only say positive things in the end um a, 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 a channel like mine would not be able to survive and for that reason there's also different content on on the channel because yeah those videos don't usually get many views and so you yeah. don't make a ton to, of money with them to yeah it, a review from a financial standpoint is really only worth doing it if it's a positive review 
and mm-hmm. that positivity leads to affiliate sales. Yeah. Um, and that is a conflict of interest, um, just in its yeah. very nature. Like you, 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 you say positive things, you earn money. It's yeah. being, ba- it's basically being paid for for having a, a positive opinion. Um, mm. uh, <laughs> here's again, I, 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 I've pointed this out before, but Patreon, really good solution to that problem. Um, people supporting creators no matter if they have a uh, purely positive or or providing an income for creators Mm. even if they don't like have a purely positive opinion that would generate them affiliate sales but also Mm. to be critical and to to maybe you know point out when a when a product is is absolute garbage um so that's that's something that helps in that regard um Also, for me, I, I I don't think you work as much with sponsors as I do, but I try to have a sponsor on every video now. Um, and that already takes care of that entire thing of, oh, this video needs to perform well and it needs to, to do affiliate sales. Hmm. Um, no, the sponsor is going to, we've got a contract, like they're going to pay no matter what and they're, they're going to allow me to, to keep doing this stuff, even when I'm like criticizing the product and also try hmm. to like, you know, another 3d printer manufacturer shouldn't be a direct competitor shouldn't be advertising their product on another uh, mm. on their competitor. it's it's a whole long thing like i i spend time thinking about it and how to do it properly um yeah that's i i, I don't want to do that much that much self-advertising but if you're interested in, in booking a sponsorship on this no. um <laughs> Yeah, also, the, so Naomi Wu also um, translated my uh, review guidelines into Chinese. Um, I've got a website up where I, I've i sat down and I thought about, okay, how what do I need to tell the manufacturer, the company, before they even think about sending me a product? What do they need to know um, so we can make that happen? And it's got stuff in there like, mm-hmm. hey, you're not going to get to review the review video. Um, you have no... Like sending a product does not mean you get a review because that, in according to German law, that would already be um, a Dauerwerbesendung. Uh, that would already mm-hmm. be paid content if that exchange of a product comes with the condition of hey, you ne- you actually need to produce a review about this. Um, so mm-hmm. I don't, I never guarantee that that products that are sent to me um, actually get a review, and I still choose which ones I then review at all. Um, yeah, all sorts of stuff that that you just have to think about and and kind of make up your mind about it and communicate them in the best possible way. Hmm. I was just uh, looking at um, on your website. Is is there like the Chinese version available there or it's not I just linked found... yet? No, I, I okay. should I should probably link that uh, there as well because a lot of stuff does get lost in translation. Yeah, might be. <laughs> Yeah, interesting topic. I found it good that Angus point pointed that out, but um, yeah, hopefully that turns things a bit to the better. But yeah. nah, probably not in the end. <laughs> low low hopes for that. Um, yeah. Because in the end, companies like Creality or all, all the other companies they they are so massive now that they really don't care about like one or two influencers saying oh well you, you guys should change no no they're, they're still going to be selling printers yeah <laughs> why, why would they need to to do stuff differently indeed indeed all right and i guess enough ranting for today uh, are, are, are we done with ranting come on <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, uh, well, how, still some closing words. No, I'm, I'm I'm trying to think of a segue to this next one. Yeah. Um, talking about ranting, greenwashing, or things that I don't know might be a bit interesting. Let's talk about another Kickstarter. <laughs> yeah, because Kickstarter was one of the things that Angus did also talk about. In, in his rant, by the way, yeah. linked link below, or not in his rant, in his uh, video. Yeah. So yeah, you did. Did you put this in here, or did I put this in here? I think you put it in there, but okay. I just did, did some research in the morning. So basically, this is this is your topic now, but it's a orange. So like the fruit orange, um, 
based or what are they calling them they're calling it another plastic reduction technique 3d printing right. using orange peels and um i guess what they are kickstarting is this is an intel italian this is a uh an Italian company that are currently kickstarting a designer lamp, which has like an orange peel vibe on the outside. And that is printed with orange peel 3D printing filament. And I found it very interesting in the beginning. And for this reason, I did some research this morning, what orange peel 3d printing material could be in the end yeah um so this this kickstarter um still running as we record this but probably by the time you you listen to this um it's gonna be it's gonna be done so it's got 71 hours to go and it's been uh, backed with thirty four thousand eight hundred euros of a three thousand euro goal i guess that the three thousand euro goal um kind of hints at how much of a hurdle they have to jump through or how little of a hurdle they have to jump through uh, to make this thing happen. So yeah. you've been looking into what this orange peel, I don't want to say base, because base gives the wrong picture, material is. Exactly. So, yeah, as I said, they are printing those lamps that have this orange peel look on the outside it's at least on a couple of the shots uh really orange and looks just as somebody has used a, a, a big piece of of orange peel and made a lamp out of yeah. it well anyways um as i said i have been uh doing some research this morning and thought okay are there ways to make yeah polymers thermoplastics out of orange peel and is this what they're using for their material and um so at first i i didn't found i didn't find really anything about that i found one presentation on i don't know a university project from 2005 where i don't know that team was proposing making um yeah a, a biopolymer or i i wouldn't even say that's a biopolymer but they uh they made or they wanted to suggest making polymers out of an ingredient that is found in orange peel which is limonene um and obviously there is a large quantity of that available because of all of the oranges that uh we are breeding and do we breed oranges? No, we are not breeding oranges. Okay. We're growing oranges well, and uh, yeah, making juice and, and other things out of them. And yeah, the leftovers are the the, the bulb, no, the pulp, pulp yeah. and the orange peel. And yeah, the orange peel, they um, contain the limonene and um, there is, they said, a process where you can um, polymerize uh, or making or make a polymer out of yeah. the limonene and uh, carbon dioxide, um, but this looked kind of futuristic. So I read over the Kickstarter once again. I watched the video, and in the end, what it turns out is it looks as if they are using the orange peels. They are drying them. They are grinding it up, and as they even state in their Kickstarter, they are then compounding those ground up orange peels with another biopolymer An which organic I guess for me biopolymer means... base come on don't don't discount the the indeed the organic <laughs> biopolymer base like that yeah so i guess in the end what they're doing is they're mixing ground up dried orange orange peels with pla um so yeah P P i was asking myself Sorry, P PLA is exactly what they're saying here. So the, the organic biopolymer base obtained from bacterial fermentation of vegetal starches. That's, I mean, <laughs> that's PLA. <laughs> yeah. 100%. The thing is that I was, or the thing that I was asking myself, is that false marketing, greenwashing, because on other pictures they're saying single body biomaterial from oranges. I... I don't know. Um, 
using orange peels as a filler in PLA might be a good thing to use less of the PLA and more of leftover waste that would otherwise be just disposed. But I don't know, in the marketing they are doing, it, it looks more as if they're selling it as as their their material is fully made out of orange peels and it's yeah totally green and everything um the, whereas in the end i think yeah. they're only using a compound yeah they're even saying single body biomaterial from oranges so yeah. that no asterisk there it just says from oranges so that is that is yeah. pretty much false false marketing and the thing is also like how much ground up orange peel organic matter can you like stuff into PLA before it becomes unprintable? I don't think it's very much. Um, probably 5% so, or something. So from the experience that I have with like doing my own uh, filament with my um, 3 Devo filament extruder is that yeah, 5% are usually no problem at all. And you, depending on the material that you're compounding or mixing with the polymer and also the properties of that material, um, usually it's not that hard to get to 10, 15, 20, or even 30%. Um, just look at the 30% carbon fiber or glass fiber filled materials. Right, so, but that is, that is like uh, engineered ingredients. That is not just ground up orange peels. So yeah, probably, probably 30% here, yeah, a bit tough to do. It might be interesting to try out. And one of the things I, I definitely want to try is um, using coffee grinds and just to infuse material with that. Uh, Pro um, pasta. And, have, have they, I think they've used actual coffee, um, coffee, well, ground coffee powder um, yeah. to, to add to their filaments, I think, right? For I, I guess, well, they also made the uh, the bacon filament oh, with, with Joel. Oh, oh that, <laughs> disgusting. Yes. Ah, but just, no, okay. I guess not everyone who is listening at the moment has already printed um, wood filled 3D printing material but everyone who has knows that printing wood filled filament is usually a really nice experience because it smells like just freshly cut wood uh, it's, it's totally pleasant most of the times it depends um, on which one you get Mo a lot of it just smells like uh, cut mdf which is yeah it, it still smells like <laughs> like woodworking but not not in a pleasant way like it doesn't have that that nice pine smell to it it doesn't have yeah it doesn't have that nice pine smell but it has like those caramelized aromas that are then floating in the room where you're printing right. and um i guess that would be interesting with the coffee and I would think that if you would, for example, uh, grind up orange peels and put them into filament, maybe you also have like a citrusy s smell during printing. Definitely. So wh what I want to say with that, I, I don't want to say that the idea is stupid of um, putting orange peels into, um, into filament because I think if um, it is nice for the looks of your product, um, you can also save a bit of even if it's biopolymer but um you can save a bit of the polymer base reduce waste in a way that you use leftover material but uh yeah just the marketing is a little bit vague what they're doing there yeah um and it's not like the the orange peels and stuff would be like actual waste because it is being used in a way that is useful these days so either um for extracting limonene um or as a feedstock um just orange peels you know whatever farm animals like those um those are being sold as that as well and that is actually something that is mentioned in the other presentation that you found um okay that's yeah that there's there's no it's not exactly waste i mean that at the very best you mm. can use it as as fertilizer and uh Mm. you know you de decompose it like that mm. yeah um what else yeah so the, the the pleasant smell while printing um omi's gonna have that you're not gonna have that at home unless you put a, a bulb in there that really heats up the filament and, and gets it to 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 <laughs> sizzle a bit um yeah it's 
it's a it's a nice idea though the the core like that they're saying that it's it's going to be a hundred percent compostable, which as always for PLA is something you should take with a grain of salt because it's not like you can just toss PLA out in in your compost pile and it's it's going to be gone after a couple of years. Mm. It needs industrial composting with the right mm. um, uh, right types of of bacteria and microorganism or organisms. <laughs> uh to to decompose it properly and by encasing orange peel uh into a pla base that then needs special uh composting mm. um environments like you, you're actually making the the orange peel less biodegradable mm. i think but i guess the idea behind that is is always well just if you would compare something with like uh polyethylene where you would uh, injection mold that or abs or polystyrene or whatever um even if you would dispose it the normal way just like in your trash bin it's will not probably be there anymore in a hundred years on um on the uh on the waste how do you say uh, uh landfill on the landfill, yeah, that's the word are, I was looking for. Are you for. sure um, about that? Uh, Plastics so, do last um, a really long time. They, they do, do they do break and, down into like little microplastic granules, but they don't like they don't turn back into oil or anything. No, they don't. But what what I want to say with that is that if you put um, a PLA part into the landfill and uh, PET part in into a landfill the pet part either will stay just as it is for thousands of years or degenerate into into microplastic whereas uh, some of the biopolymers will like break even more down that they're less okay. a harm for the environment yeah, they've, they've got the a long chance run. of being decomposed at all whereas you the exactly the petrochemicals uh, the regular yeah. plastics petrochemicals yeah. um they they just yeah, gets yeah. gets smaller and smaller eventually. So yeah, I guess that's that's a good thing. But like, why not just use PLA then, um, and use orange peel Marketing. where it's where it's most effective? Yeah, it's it's a nice filler. Um, kind of reminds me but, of the algae filled um, plastics that I tested mm -hmm. once. Those were like either so poorly printable that um, there was really no point in in using that amount of fill, or there was so little in it that it's like, well, this is this is PLA that has a bit of a funny smell. So, mm. <laughs> yeah. But so, um, I I, I still want to give them credit for using that because in the end, it's it's like an artistic part. Somebody has yeah. thought about the design and also uh, the shape and also the material of what they want to use for that lamp and um having this this orange that is in the material itself and also the form and the outer shape and the texture of of the part um gives it a really nice whole picture yeah. as they, i said i just find the marketing that. yeah i find the marketing a bit strange um might actually motivate me to to try that out on my own if if it's if yeah. i can really just uh grind up orange peel and put it into pla i i would assume the what what they're showing like the way that it's like such a consistent and vibrant orange that there's also orange colorant in there i don't think just definitely just plain orange peel would give you that that look because it's a very opaque mm. um look if you if you have orange peel like there's going to be lots of that white fuzz stuff in there too i guess and if you have ever like dehydrated like orange slices for for Christmas uh, yeah. decoration, you know that the orange will turn brown. And there are some pictures in the uh, I think in the Kickstarter where they show that uh, this turns out really just like brownish in the end. So either the final part doesn't have this vibrant orange color in the end, or uh, they're adding like colorants to the mix um, to so, have yeah. a more consistent result in the end yeah yeah so the the other uh, the other paper or the other presentation i guess that he that he picked out um or that you found from from 2005 um and that is actually something that that is pretty interesting because it's um 
it's not that approach that we just talked about where it's PLA and you add a filler to it. It's actually producing a novel polymer from the limonene that you get out of orange peels. Uh, limonene, mm -hmm. you, you may have actually worked with limonene uh, for like removing the old stickered uh PEI beds. Um, limonene was the solvent that you would use to get that that 3M tape off. And I mean, even even in household cleaners and stuff, it's it's usually in there either as a either as a uh, just a fragrance or as an actual cleaning agent. Um, so mm -hmm. that is that is a solvent or a is it a solvent? Yeah, I guess it's a solvent. That's it's it's just a liquid chemical that we do have in abundance, mm -hmm. more or less. And they are so the, the basic process is you take that the basic process got there like 20 processing <laughs> steps in this thing um but like i said inputs are limonene limonene and co2 and you get a uh you get a polymer out that has from what i've read pretty good properties like very usable properties it's not like a um mm. you know like it's a special use case that you know only works in one or two uh, cases but it's a it's a pretty universal polymer um mm. One thing question. That, yes. Does that make it a biopolymer and does it does that make it biodegrad biodegradable? So a biopolymer, yes, I would say, because it's from yeah. well then isn't anything that's oil based a bio bioplastic too? Because technically well, it's like it's 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 dinosaurs. <laughs> So all of, of the diesel and, and petrol we're using is biofuel. also uh, like biofuel. <laughs> Technically, I guess. Squeezed out dinosaurs. Yeah. Sl sl a, couple, um, a couple of processing steps in there in between. Because I, I, I guess this is something really interesting because just using a, a material that you get from nature, so a, a biosource to generate a material doesn't necessarily mean that is also biodegradable in the end i guess yeah for sure you can you can process something so far that you know it, the the natural yeah. organisms are not going to have any chance of breaking mm -hmm. that down anymore yeah so, so i guess pla is is good in that term because on the one side it is made from yeah starches and on the other hand if you dispose it and compose it it's also biodegradable again and will not turn to uh just like smaller and smaller bits of plastic yeah. over the years yeah um one of the one of the things that i that i found that that then needs a bit more explanation or that that should be looked into critically is like they're saying oh we, we we're gonna have See, we're going to grab CO2 as a um, as an input um, when we're going to use CO2. And even in 2005, they realized, hey, the price of CO2 is probably going to come down as it actually needs to be sequestered somehow. Um, and it needs to be taken out of the atmosphere to, to reach um, climate goals, which, yeah, we're doing a great job with. But that's a different topic. So what I'm seeing is that they're taking CO2. They're saying, oh, we can capture it out of power plants which are, you know, obviously great producers of uh, CO2. And we can put it into this, uh, this now biopolymer as a, as an, what's the English word, word of uh, educt, of an of a input um, to that process. Product. Yeah. So we take that as an input and um, we're, we're therefore sequestering CO2 into those polymers. The, the the thing I'm I'm seeing here is yeah you're taking that CO2 you are now putting it into a product that is captured in that product but what happens at end of life like what happens when that thing gets like if it's biodegradable once it starts degrading does that CO2 get released again um, does it end up in a uh, what do they call it? trash burning power plant um, and basically release that fossil CO2 again you're not really mm taking that co2 and absorbing it permanently you're just temporarily storing it in in people's plastic products and uh, yeah yeah Should um and then you also need to account for all the energy you, you need to uh well produce that that material in the end and yeah that might be uh more or less depending on how complex the process is um well 
on the one hand, if you think about trees or woods, they're also just like, yeah, they're capturing sunlight and taking CO2 out of the air and producing wood. And then we burn it again and release it again. So they're just yeah. a, a temporary storage of, of CO2 if we are not like burying them and making oil or something like that out of them over uh, hundreds of yeah. millions of years. Yeah, it, it is a problem when there is uh, old forests that are being uh, har harvested, cut down. Um, because at some point you, you are releasing that, that CO2 again and new forests, new farmed forests, um, they, they're not as great at, at absorbing CO2 as the old the old growth that was there so if mm. you if you cut into like um indigenous forests basically you are you're making a net you're having a net emission by using that that uh, that wood but there is a process which i don't think is used any you know in in at at any there is a process that is not being used at any significant scale um Cody from Cody's lab showed that once, uh, making bio biocharcoal basically um, by um, oxidizing. No, is it oxidizing? By charring that wood, uh, turning it into charcoal, and then that charcoal is a much more stable um, mm. containment of the carbon that's been captured by yeah. the tree originally. And it can be used as fertilizer or it can just be stowed in, in old mines and stuff. Um, so that mm. is a that would be something that, that wood would be good at you know when it comes to the to the end of life mm. of wood products but yeah there is a discussion whether you know for example uh constructing buildings out of wood is actually better or worse overall um than using bricks or i mean concrete is is, is horrible but you know uh, clay mm. bricks for example or mm. um well sandwich panels of like steel uh rock wool and steel on the other side so yeah it's it's a complex topic. That's all I'm trying to say, right? Yeah. <laughs> all right. So I guess that's that's it on on biopolymers for today. Uh, do, well, why do we always have to cut off these topics so harsh? Are, are we are we just good uh, ramblers? Yeah, and yeah, we 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 ramble too much, uh, or maybe from time to time and i don't want to scare the listeners so but isn't, isn't that maybe what a podcast a good is all about it is it is but just rambling about something for an hour i i'm i'm really happy to do that but i i think not everyone who is listening uh might be happy <laughs> all right next topic then the uh soldering robot then. that you put in there by who was it uh hydrosis for raspberry yeah so I guess in one of the last podcasts, we have seen the um, machine that was printed on a 3D printer that then assembled yeah. sandwiches and, and things like that. And this soldering robot, um, I have seen a couple of days on my Twitter feed, um, or was it on, I think it was on Hackaday, uh, was also really interesting because he, that guy was basically repurposing his 3D printer to solder through hole components um, on PCBs. Yeah. So the it's a, it's a longer 3D machine. Um, doesn't matter. It's an N3. Uh, and basically, he's using the X, Y, and Z motion to move a soldering iron and a um, solder dispenser basically i love the fact that he's just reusing the the stock extruder with a, with a little bone tube uh to feed yeah. in the the solder um the solder wire to his solder joints and it's actually working pretty well so he's doing through hole mm -hmm. obviously no no smt um but basically the components are already in the board the board's upside down so you have the, the solder joints uh, facing up and the components are already in the board there's a little uh, 3d printed bracket that holds those components i think it's it's just headers that he's soldering here um and then the machine moves to every single solder spot heats up the joint a bit or presses that over heats up the joint a bit and then feeds in solder at an angle from the other side and that makes for i mean some of the joints look a bit cold but um it makes for a that's that's just tweaking right you just uh extend the, the solder time a bit um but it makes for a for a really effective automated uh platform here 
Mm -hmm. Do you know, well, you probably know, how are through-hole components um, soldered to a PCB on an industrial scale? So typically it's uh, wave soldering. Um, that is the, the most common one. So if you have a, if you have a PCB, um, you have all your through hole components and it is, it, it, they get plugged into the board. And then either if you have no SMTs on the bottom or nothing that, that can get clogged up, it just mm -hmm. rides over a wave of solder. So you have a, a solder bath and a little pump and there's a, mm -hmm. a little jet. I mean, not like spraying mm -hmm. out, but just, just lifting above the surface slightly um, yeah. of that molten, molten solder. It touches to the underside of those pins and those get soldered in an instant, basically. Mm. Um, yeah. Typically, if you have SMT components on the bottom, there's a bit of, of spacing just so you don't melt those off. You do the SMTs before you do the through holes. So mm -hmm. that's, that's a, a super fast process. Or I've also seen, um, you know, Chinese assembly line workers where there's literally uh, a woman sitting there with a soldering iron going to zip, zip, zip. If you have a uh, lower volume production, that is apparently mm -hmm. viable as well. I don't know how hot that soldering iron was set to, but it's, it, it must have been pretty crazy. <laughs> but so in the end, I think the soldering robot since, um, <clears throat> sorry, like uh, reflow soldering of uh, SMD components is something that I think many are doing just on, well, at home on a small production scale um, pretty easily because the equipment is not expensive yeah, and you can iron. order uh, uh, like use, this. Use a, a cloth, clothes iron. <laughs> yeah, something yeah. like that. Um, if you're having like a small scale production where you need uh, through hole components, Something like that, if you're making a hundred, two hundred, a thousand, might might be a feasible machine instead of yeah. hand soldering everything. Yeah, it's. I mean, he's using like two positions right now. Um, there's two holders for the PCBs. I guess you would you would want a couple more so you don't have to mm -hmm. uh, tend to the printer every couple minutes um, and swap out the boards. But yeah, it's it saves you a bit of time. Sure, you could probably solder this faster than the machine does, but the machine does it by itself and you don't need any you don't need to be there um, you can do something else while it yep. does it um, obviously at an industrial yep. scale this is way too slow but for that mid-range um, or mid-volume manufacturing totally viable now I did put two notes into our, our show notes and that's um, like how is the um, how is the g-code generated for that and how are those mm -hmm. holders generated that hold the components? Because if you have um, mm -hmm. like headers and stuff, they need to be that they're not always the same height. Um, so you need different geometry on the bottom just to support those so that the pins stick out the right amount. And also like hand programming the individual solder joints, uh, probably a bit too tedious, um, even for doing, you know, a hundred boards or so. So mm -hmm. that's something that, that, can be done. I don't know if, if, if he's doing that already with us, but I'm pretty sure that at least the G-code, the G-code should be trivial um, just to generate that from the manufacturing files for the PCB. Um, so you just go to every single XY position and uh, you know run a little macro that solders that joint. But mm -hmm. that that support print on the bottom, I think that's the, that's the interesting one. Um, I, I guess if you're just having like a showcase of like what he currently does i personally would not spend the time of, of programming something that uh, might do it automatically um so just yeah take the design and uh, just uh, de 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 design that uh, the, n the negative shape of that but as you pointed out um if you're using eagle or a kicad or something you basically have the three-dimensional shapes of those parts so there would be a way to generate those holders for the pcb automatically yeah especially with the way that um i mean eagle is autodesk now of course um especially with the way that eagle is integrated with fusion 3 well integrated it's more of like a an exchange format that's being passed back and forth like it's not super smooth um the way that, that that's all one or that, that they're trying to make that all one program, like you get Eagle, the full Eagle version with the Fusion subscription now, um, 
they they are pushing uh, components having 3D models pretty hard in Eagle. So um, you would theoretically get the geometry of your parts already, and then it's just I guess an, a script that exports it over to to Fusion, and then in Fusion you would generate that geometry, that whole uh, geometry somehow. Hmm. Should definitely be possible, but probably a bit much to figure out um, for it figure out to do automatically um, for the scale that's 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 happening here. If you're doing, if mm. if this will be something that tons of people um, want to build and, and implement for themselves, then that will probably be worth uh, looking into. But for for one dude um, doing this for himself and maybe doing a total of I don't know five or ten individual or five or ten unique PCB designs, probably not worth doing doing the mm. whole export script thing. Yeah, so so if, if maybe somebody's looking for a topic for a bachelor's or master thesis uh, and is interested in, in design and electronics, maybe think about programming a macro that can do that. I think many might be happy because I think I feel that the concept is is pretty nice. But since I'm not that deep into electronics, I don't know how many would have need for something like that. Okay. I know that SMD soldering and reflow soldering is is done by many, but I don't know just how much of a hassle that currently is. Yeah, it's, I, I guess that there's, there's two trends that are kind of working against each other. Like on the one hand, we get, um, we have access to really advanced and, and capable machines with 3D printers and all the, the stuff that they have spawned as far as motion control and, and motion systems go. But on the other hand, PCB manufacturing is is becoming so ubiqu ubiquitous, fast, and cheap that it's that in a lot of cases it just does not make the sense to either make the boards yourself or then skip uh, the assembly of the boards um, and do it yourself. So mm. we'll we'll have to see if this is something that that's actually that people want to do in the long run, want yeah. to do themselves. So yeah, cool cool concept. Definitely. Um, yeah. It's just, as always, like how complex is it to use? But another thing that I put in here is the, the pl Plutr, Plutr, Plutr V2. Um, so that's the Palantir uh, V2 because PLTR is uh, the um, the stock symbol for Palantir. Um, no, it's the Plotter, <laughs> Plotter V2 by, by Andrew Sink. Um, very similar idea. Right, you've you've seen that, right? Yeah. Okay, I was hoping so, that that you would uh, take that take it from here. <laughs> yeah, well, well, it's it's basically a, a pen holder that you can strap on a three D printer that you can use for like painting interesting things, or paint automatically painting things. It's yeah. less complex than the soldering robot, but just shows uh, other ways how you could repurpose one of these uh yeah machines in the end yeah plying pl plotters are still really cool um there's something that that's been yeah. around in the early days of of computer graphics and stuff of, of cad tools where you could plot out your your drawings um now of course you would say like why not just use a printer inkjet printer or something but the quality and the yeah really the, the quality and the feel you get from a really from a drawn um plot basically from a plotted drawing mm. drawn plot plotted drawing um is so different from from just an inkjet or a laser print because you can yeah. use whatever pens you want you get those crisp lines you can see it's actually a vector that's been drawn and not just a bunch of like individual mm. ink dots that have been sprayed on there it's it's really fascinating and yeah having a plotter tool head like that super cool to have um i've th th there are there are diy versions of course that you can do um the the plotter v2 is something that you can either buy as as plans for five bucks or you can just buy the complete tool head for 15 bucks um, yeah yeah but just another show and i guess well there yeah there are also things like um drag knives available on thingiverse that you can strap on your 3d printer um i have seen I hope I pronounce his name or the channel name uh, uh, properly. I guess our Portuguese uh, friend in Texas. Ah, right, uh, right, yeah, yeah. Who has, I'm yeah, yeah. Try and pronounce uh, it. who has put a MIG torch 
on a right, 3D yeah. printer. The results were n not that great and I might have done it differently, but yeah, um, why don't you use a um, like a cheap motion system and make a DED, direct energy deposition printer out of it? Yeah. Uh, this old Tony's done a video about that. Um, this old just, Tony, yeah, yeah, just welding up that circle with that that tube. <laughs> um, with but it's harder than you think in the end, yeah. Uh, yeah, surprise. I mean, surprisingly good results, though. I mean, this old Tony, yeah, he had really good results. Of uh, course, but like not you need to deal. Of course, sorry. <laughs> Please go ahead. Uh, not not comparable to doing like. Um, you know, actual sintering or, you know, where you start with the powder and you, you do like laser sintering and stuff. But the thing is for, for bigger parts, um, this application is something that is, is pretty common. So there is one Berlin company who is, which is called, uh, did you, uh, whatever. Uh, it's, <laughs> right. it's a, a big Berlin company that are doing wire DED, um, print machines to print parts out of titanium, Inconel, or, or things like that. I think North, Norsk Titanium, who are also having one of their titanium parts in, uh, in a Boeing Dreamliner, they also print like a raw part using such a process out of okay. titanium wire then they machine all of the outside and uh, they save themselves a lot of machining because they the, sh the shape is already like near to the final yeah com compared shape. to machining it um, from a solid block exactly yeah or you save the time for getting um, a forged part for example because uh, like ordering forged parts in a small quantity can take yeah a year two years and maybe sometimes you don't have that have the time for that so this is not a process that is mm, totally unusable in the end but you need to have specific uh, specific applications for that um tanks for storing tr cryogenic oh. <laughs> uh fuels for um like, for rockets like tank the container not tank the uh the war there mobile. We no <laughs> tanks uh, for storing cryogenic uh, f fuels. Uh, there are some projects going on using, uh, yeah, wire DED manufacturing for that because scaling up j a motion system is really easy. Scaling up a powder 3D printing, uh, a powder 3D printer is very hard and we're still limited to like, I'd say like a meter by a meter by, 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 by something else uh, yeah. for such machines, but yeah, CNC controlled. Why um, CNC controlled MIG gun is e easy. I don't yeah. want to speak about the process itself and the, the warping you're getting and, and yeah, things like obviously that. that but... That's all stuff that still needs to be figured out. But yeah. <laughs> the, the core, the core is there. And but, but that that's how that's how uh, you know film and three D printing started out as well. Like they solved yeah. the stuff that they could solve and we're like, well, this, the results we're getting aren't great yet, but then over time and over, you know, with, with gaining experience and just lots of people doing it and, and, and figuring out one little bit at a time, we, we got to where we are now, which is every print is an end of three. Ha, huh, great. <laughs> <laughs> exactly where we want it to be. Let's move on to question. Maybe this one just for a second. Hermetic jazz. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I was gonna. Skip. Yeah. Oh, okay. No. Um. So we previously spoke about generating an STL out of or a parametric STL out of a CAD file or out of a um, Gerber file. So when we talked about the uh, the soldering machine, um, Fusion three hundred and sixty has a new tool which you can use to convert. STLs into parametric CAD files. Yes, that was possible in the past, but in the past, um, Fusion just like translated each triangle yeah, of yeah. an STL file into like um, a, um, a, 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 a surface a CAD face, surface, basically, yeah. A surface face, and that just blew up the models. 
Yeah. Fusion 360, I think since two weeks or something like that, has the opportunity. Um, I don't know how the feature is called, but I can check that. Um, to do a more sensible way of converting a surface into a CAD file. So basically recon recognizing uh, flat shapes, recognizing like fillets and chamfers and, and things yeah. like that. So in, which in is the end you get a, pretty cool. In the end, you get something that has features, um, that has, yeah. I, I guess, parametric features. Yeah, you, you get, you, you don't just get the solid object, which is like, oh, chunk that looks like this. It is still versus, a chunk. It is still a chunk. Well, yeah, but it has That's, it has individual features. Like what we had before was just like, this is object finished. And now yeah. it's like actual, cl first of all, it's clean geometry. Like a hole is going to be a hole. Yeah. Um, a, yep. a, an extrusion is going to be an extrusion. Um, but also you can edit those, right? So are those, yeah. are those you, exactly. you, get a, you get an actual feature history for, for those parts, right? No, you're not getting a feature history. Okay. That, that's what I wanted to say. But you have like, so um, a, a flat surface will be just one object and not like every triangle of a flat surface will right. be its individual um, sh shape. Um, how do you say? Yeah, flat, yeah. flat cat surface. So um, the models turn out way more clean as they were before. And the thing is that this allows you to uh, then, for example, just really select a surface and extrude that surface yeah. or um, yeah, place uh, sketches on surfaces and do extrusions and, and use them in your sketches and things like that. Like a proper way to convert an STL file back to a CAD file. It sounds better than it is in the end because in the end it's it's not that easy um so how it works um in fusion 360 it's actually called um yeah parametric um well when you're using the convert to mesh option there's the the operation parametric what it actually right. does in the in the background um you need to create face groups before face groups meaning that you need to group couple of faces together that form um, more or less a cat feature. So all of the flat surfaces need to be a separate face group. If you have ever used Mesh Mixer, for example, that's an easy way how you can, uh, for example, find edges of a part and things like that. Right. Fusion also comes with um, with uh, tools to do that, where, for example, like fillets and things like that are, are recognized automatically. But sometimes, especially if you have freeform shapes or a surface the surfaces that are tangentially connected, um, creating those features is sometimes hard. And if you are not properly declaring those uh, mesh groups also the conversion will not work properly okay. but especially if you have parts that have um, sharp edges and not a lot of fillets the face group generation is working really easily and then also um, creating um, the cat part out of that face group STL file is often working really flawless and it just opens you the, the possibility to way easier to, um, to way easier do uh, modifications on, on such parts yeah. where you maybe not, don't have, um, the, like the source cat file or in a step file available or something like that. Yeah, obviously that also opens up a, a huge um, a huge possibility of doing reverse engineering and kind of making a somebody else's uh, STL. I mean, it would work for scans, right? Um, that's the that's the, it the would idea, work for I guess. scans. Yeah, um, not I just guess that's uh, yeah. I that, guess that's that's the initial idea be, be behind that. Um, if you have parts from from Thingiverse uh, and you want to like get the cat file again yeah that's something nice that you want to have but in in the end it's a paid feature in fusion 360 yeah. where something like that is is really useful is if you have if you 3d scan a part and if you want to reverse engineer that 3d 
uh, scan part easily into yeah a modifiable CAD file. Yeah, uh, and not just in terms of like fitting surfaces over it and don't recognizing like any of the features. Yeah, thankfully, as long as it's a uh, as long as it's a functional part, copyright doesn't really apply to it, so we're all good there. Um, yeah. yeah. So how what, what what I'm thinking of like how accurate is that that detection? Because STL is not a format that has like indefinite um, accuracy as far as like how precisely those those points are positioned um if you for example if you take a, a a simple model and you export it to an stl on like the fine export and you import it back into fusion and you use that feature detect feature uh how close does it end up to the original cat part like for example hole sizes does a four millimeter hole end up mm. as a four millimeter hole or does it become a uh 3.98 millimeter one how uh, how accurately are angles preserved like does it i think that's probably mm. the diff most difficult one um mm. stuff like threads I, I guess it would completely fail on um how, how well does yeah. it work for that um i'm not sure i'm it's probably using some kind of a tolerance in the background where Must it says be. okay yeah. that is close enough um what I think what they might be doing in the background is they are fitting surfaces over either all of the points um, of the face group that you have selected or over all of the lines um, to represent those as close as possible and don't even take a look at the surfaces themselves or the triangles themselves. But of course, there's a tolerance in the background. The thing is, if you, for example, have a whole feature this would also mean that um, this might actually reverse the problem that holes that are tessellated are getting smaller. Because if you are fitting uh, a surface over those points, this surface is probably more into the part than uh, yeah the, the yeah. facets of the model. Yeah, if you just generate the points on the the radius of whatever hole you have, then those actual facets are going to be inwards. So I guess now yeah. now, you, now you're getting the problem the other direction. Yeah. Mm. Well, the thing is, in the end, it's it's still a bit of reverse engineering, and it can't do real magic in the background and um, like increase the really increase the accuracy of a badly tessellated STL. It can only do a, a best guess, yeah. but in many applications that might already be enough because in FDM 3D printing, do you care about a hundredth of a millimeter? Yeah. Do you care about a tenth of a millimeter? Usually not. It's just about making it modifiable a, a bit more easily than, than working on whatever, you know, chunk mm. of part you have uh, or you had before. Yeah. So, cool feature. Unfortunately, yeah. part of the paid fusion plan. So, yeah, chances are low that uh, maybe maybe they have like a free weekend at some point, uh, free trial. Well, they I do have. Seen do that they have free trials? Um, I don't know how it is with Fusion Three Hundred and Sixty at the moment. If you have a thirty-day trial and then you can opt in for the. Uh, personal use or, or startup license thing right. but yeah that feature is only available in the $500 a year plan or what is it $350 yeah. or something like that so only in the paid version at the moment um, how are you getting to use it then kind of a shame sorry how are you getting to use it then how did I use I, I'm an Autodesk influencer just oh. as you are oh yeah <laughs> uh, we, we get stuff for free even if I mean, yeah. I, I would be, I would probably be happy with the with the free version. Um, but they reached out and were like, "Hey, would you like this?" I'm like, "Sure, I guess can come in yeah. use." Like, I, I don't think I'm using any of the of the paid features. Um, like this, this entire bed changer was done in Fusion, and it's it's literally all yeah. like linear extrusions and whole features. <laughs> there's there's nothing, nothing advanced about this yeah. thing at all. No, well, me neither. the 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 reason I was looking for that that perk was uh, i have a fourth axis for my snapmaker 3d printer right. cnc router laser thing and i wanted to have an option for also using another 
CAM software for preparing the G code for the SnapMaker um, in comparison to their own slicer or like um, a bundle software. And more than three axis machining is unfortunately only available in the paid version yeah. of Fusion 360. So, and well, since I don't do any like contract design work and use three Fusion 360 and show it on my channel, I don't know. I, I guess that's a good deal for both Autodesk and, and me and you and whoever. Yeah. I mean, like, like we said before, with the, with the entire, hey, three printer companies are just making more printers to saturate the market. Like as long as a company is like visible when present, I guess it's good for them. Yeah. So yeah, cool feature in infusion. Um, yeah, also, uh, one thing that, that still kind of stinks, um, my second most popular video, I think, um, the topology-optimized shelf brackets um, yep. that turned out with a really cool shape that was, of course, like, <laughs> intentionally um, tweaked that way. Uh, that feature of doing at least the... Um, what is it, topology optimization, not the generative design. Topology mm -hmm. optimization now isn't, or since a while actually, is not a part of the free plan anymore. Um, yeah. That kind of sucks. So half of the comments on the video is like, hey, uh, I, I, I can't find that feature in the free version anymore. It's mm -hmm. just you're, you're, you're at the whim of Autodesk if you're, or you're at the whim of whatever company you're using a free tool mm -hmm. of if they also have, when they also have a, a paid version that is uh, mm -hmm. featuring exclusive features. Yeah, it's a pity, but I don't know. We would still have the option to use FreeCAD, but for me, it's just Fusion works. I've been using Fusion for for years, so if I do have the option, I would like to continue using it. And since there's still a quite feature-packed uh, personal version of Fusion 360 available, I can always I can also produce content there where there's not a paywall to use the I don't know the the yeah. methodologies I I show in the video. And that's I mean that that's pretty much yeah uh, where, where where I'm saying too like FreeCAD I want to use FreeCAD um I I I want to use free open source tools wherever possible it's just that in a lot of cases they're not as good as the the commercial ones like I've I've tried working on Linux for a while. Wasn't the great... I mean, it works for a while, but then it's like, hey, something breaks and uh, you, you, you're screwed. Uh, I mean, happens on Windows too, but okay. Uh, mm. I want to use a... I, I would love to use a, a free open source um, video editor. Um, I mean, for, for 3D CAD, Blender, absolutely feasible. Like 3D work or 3D artist work in Blender. Probably as good as everything else. Video editors... Not as much. I use Resolve. You do too. Um, which is, yeah, it has, it's a freemium model. You have a free version or you can buy the, the paid version. Um, yeah, CAD, same thing. Like, I, I wish FreeCAD was as good as Fusion. I've, um, my disclaimer, I've not used it in a while. Um, I do try it on and off, but it's never at the point where it's, where it's, intuitive enough to to just allow me to jump i know jump in i know gina hoiska actually made the switch um she was using fusion mm. 360 uh, for a while and is now completely on FreeCAD. so i guess i should i just try it out and and see how far i get and, and how many issues i run into the, might be interesting the thing is also what i'm trying to get is uh, the thing is also like is there an audience for that um because at the end of the day my job and yours to a large extent too is to produce content that people want to watch like is there an audience for um for, for is there an audience for for me trying to um find my way into freecat because in the end i mean if it's if that is if that process is not something that that people care about like there's no there's no incentive for me to uh, to to spend that time on trying to learn freehand and trying to learn how that works, when I could just as well use Fusion and Fusion is just in the background for most of the stuff I do. I, I don't make videos about Fusion itself most of the time. I guess maybe there 
is not a huge audience at the moment who is already using FreeCAD, but I think there is a huge audience for people that are looking for a really free, like free beer, um, cat software. Um, and maybe they're currently just not aware what is on the market and how far you can get with those tools. So I am quite sure that content on such a topic might be really interesting and might spark a lot of interest in that direction. And that is, that might also be really um, positive for such a project because with more people using it, uh, getting funding, getting donations, and then in the end also getting, getting, um, getting development done is, is yeah. just accelerated that way. Just look at Blender. Yeah. Scaling, scaling is re from, from what I've heard, scaling is really hard for, um, for like those smaller open source projects. Like mm. once you're at the scale of Blender where it's what, how, how many people are working full time on that? 20, 50, 100 people? Um, yeah. Because they have like all the infrastructure to work like a software company. If you're just two people, um, maybe at all working on this, like in your, in your free evenings, um, in making use of extra funding can be, can be kind of tough, especially when it's just a bit and it's not like, oh, we can hire two people and, and pay them to actually work on the project. Just from, from what I so, hear, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure funding for, for open source projects is always important. And, you know, if, if it allows people to work on, on the stuff actually part time and, and scale down their regular mm -hmm. job. But most of the time, people are still working a regular job aside from their open source projects they're working on for free. Yeah, definitely. Um, I guess at some point you have to decide if you want to basically make kind of a company out of it and have like full-time developers and somebody who organizes everything and i don't know everything that is is involved in like larger scale software development so i in i i will not say the name but i interestingly know one of the main developers of another like popular open source uh software which is gets kind of in that direction and uh, well he told me yeah they also get a bunch of donations and support but they are still it's still all of them doing that basically in their free time and the donations end up piling up and in the past they use it for just a big meeting every year to i don't know fly to a convention somewhere and and have fun there uh of course that's that's working if people are doing that for fun and in their spare time but that also gets you to uh, only gets you to, to some point but yeah i don't know um i don't really know the backgrounds of of uh of uh, freecad but attention to a project and maybe also support for a project is usually beneficial usually yeah okay let's leave it at that um and close this one out with a question did you did you like black out the name intentionally no but i think you okay did, did, did you did you use the uh dark theme in in, in youtube maybe it was me um so Possibly. i wasn't able to remove the background <laughs> there so everything was black before and i tried to change it to normal uh, colors bioluminous commercial art service i think they they also had a question on patreon or somewhere or in chat or some somewhere on my channel somewhere or it was on the podcast last time um longish question but basically you, you summed it up really well um, when, when we went through these topics. Is like, is there why is there no one ultimate filament? Like, why is there not one that has heat resistance, doesn't warp, prints easily, and can be recycled cleanly anywhere in the world instead of having to pick and choose um, out of the commercially available filaments? So, yeah. In reasons for MSLA, yeah, that's that's a different topic. But but basically, why is there no no one size fits all uh, filament for FDM? I guess because there's probably basically also no like one polymer fits all application, one metal fits all application. Um, 
it would be nice if something like that existed, but some properties might be maybe contradicting it, just in the beginning. And um, yeah, as I said, I, I wouldn't be aware that something like that existed. Why is, why is a car not made out of like just one metal that is good in everything? Why are, I don't know, why don't we have the ultimate material at the moment? Because I think it's not existing. It's a question of price. It's a question of uh, properties that might be contradicting. I don't know. What, what's yeah, your just, take on that? Just just use graphene for everything. Graphene solves all our problems, right? Doesn't it? <laughs> it's like Car the, the carbon nanotubes. Yeah. Or yeah. Exactly. It's the the wonder materials that does does it does it all. Um, from what I'm seeing, I mean, actually, like like fiber reinforcement might actually be a, a really good thing if we can figure out how to actually implement them properly. Um, the the properties that is giving like high heat resistance and does not warp. From my understanding, those are two things that are like exactly diam diametrically, the completely opposing to each other. Like if you have a material that does not warp, well, unless you have a polymer that doesn't shrink when it cools, um, but like high heat with a with the polymers we have today, high heat resistant means it it solidifies or it only becomes soft at a very high temperature. Which means for our 3D printing applications, you, you, you extrude it very hot. Um, and then from like, let's say 250 degrees, um, and then at 200 degrees, it's already mostly solid. That temperature, uh, difference between 200 degrees, where it's almost solid to room temperature at 20 degrees Celsius, uh, that's 180 degrees. So you take your, or 180 Kelvin, whatever you want to do, you take your, your expansion coefficient, you multiply that by 180, and that's going to be a larger number than a polymer um, that gets soft at 60 degrees Celsius, like like PLA, that just has to cool down 40 degrees to 20 degrees ambient. So you have a a, a much larger temperature difference, um, which you know causes warping. That that contraction of your typically it's a contraction um, of a material as it cools down. That is exactly what causes you warping. So. It's exactly the relationship we're seeing with, um, you know, ABS, high, high temperature resistance, but also warps a lot versus PLA, low temperature resistance, but does not warp. It's kind of like, yeah, it's you, you can have one or the other, but not both at the time, uh, both at the same time. Um, then with recycle cleanly anywhere in the world, um, like, I guess it could work if, you, if you're actually doing recycling and you're melting it down. But for example, once you go into easily biodegradable, um, it's also a problem of, okay, when does the material decide, oh, I'm still in use and I shouldn't degrade versus, oh, I'm now, I'm now end of life and I should degrade cleanly. Like there's, there's a, you can't really make a material that, that is easily degradable, but also long lasting in, in typical use. And if you don't do that, if you have a, a product that only lasts a couple of weeks, you're not solving any problems because you're really just increasing the demand for more virgin uh, polymer to be produced. And that that's not good for anyone. So, yeah, yeah and also cost, of course, like you mentioned. I'm, I'm sure there, there are materials that are fantastic, like carbon nanotube filled, uh crystalline whatever um but yeah too too expensive like nobody wants to pay i mean how how expensive is is p e k even or p e a k um two two uh, let's say five hundred bucks a kilo yeah that's probably on on the cheaper side even like come on you you no. nobody's gonna pay that that's that's over ten times no. or that's twenty times as expensive as a regular filament no. And you don't no. need that for most cases. So, yeah. If if you are interested in stories about such a material, uh, read or listen to Project Hail Mary, uh, the new book by by Andy Weir who wrote The Martian. Oh, there is a material called xenonite, uh, which is basically the one material that is perfect for everything. Um, can really recommend that book. Nice read, nice listen. Um, not sponsored. Uh, I was going to say uh, that sounds like an Audible sponsorship. 
I, I, I don't know. I could, but I, I might be able to put my affiliate link down, uh, down there. But no, sure, um, sure. yeah, I, I think such a material in the end doesn't really exist. Um, um, and I don't know if there is the possibility that something like that existed due to these contradicting uh, properties. Um, so there is still the market for having to select a material for a specific ap applications, ap application depending on uh, price, usability, property, and things like that. Yeah. It's just as with metals. Why is not everything made out of high strength steel yeah because maybe that stuff is not that good in corrosion resistant why is not everything made out of corrosion resistant steel because it's not that strong and has other yeah it's exactly that exactly and but xenonite can do anything <laughs> yeah uh it, also one, one thing that an efficient market should be able to do is to um to provide you with a um, basically a selection of materials that the better they get as far as properties go, the more expensive they are. Or actually the other way around. Uh, mm -hmm. The more expensive a material is, the better it should be as well. doesn't always work um, perfectly, but theoretically that's the way it should work. Like if you pay more yeah. for like construction material, it should also have better properties. Because anything that is more expensive mm -hmm. but isn't better um, shouldn't exist on the market. Theoretically, yeah. again, doesn't always work that way. Um, <laughs> All right. So yeah, with the Xenonite um, reference here, I think that is the uh, that's the episode. We've made it through. Finally, <laughs> thank you for your time, Tom. Thank you for listening. Uh, as always, if you have questions, uh, yeah, just put them down in the YouTube comments or tweet to us at the melt zone if you want to support us there are links to our patron down in the description and i guess i well we hope to see you or well hear you on the next one we, we, we're not we're not hearing anyone we're not seeing anyone no we're They're not hearing anyone. us but yeah yeah uh, th thanks I hope for joining us hearing us in the next one thanks for joining <laughs> right. us bye bye bye